Cool. Oh. The time is 45, but we'll stop at 30. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm here to present to you a, a solution scenario for a cargo company. Um, so let's get started with uh, our actors and licenses, first of all. Um, so in terms of our internal users, uh, we have uh, regional sales teams. Uh, there's about a thousand of those. Uh, we have our mass market sales team. Uh, there's about a hundred of those people. And we also have our marketing users. Uh, no numbers on those, and likewise for our operations. Um, and we also have uh, cargo drivers who will drive the trucks. Uh, and there's also some other employees, non-specified. Uh, in terms of uh, licenses, um, so um, we have need of both uh, sales and service uh, objects. So on that basis, we will require a service cloud license for the majority of our users. So for regional sales, mass market, the marketing users will also require a marketing user um, feature license. Um, operations users, um, cargo drivers uh, will just need a sales cloud. And our other employees, there's a request for collaboration uh, so they can make use of uh, chatter-free uh, licenses. Those are the internal users. Um, in terms of the external users, we have our customers. Um, there is over 5 million of those uh, and they will require a customer community license. And then if we look at the structure of the organization with the role hierarchy, uh, this is a, a business based in the United States um, and they have um, a number of regions, uh, five regions uh, across the country. Uh, so at the top we have CEO, uh, reporting to them we have our SVP of sales. And then in terms of the sales hierarchy, um, there is a regional model. So we have uh, a VP of uh, regional sales. Um, and this is for our um, corporate uh, high touch, that they're also referred to, users. Um, so there will be five of these uh, across our regions. So there is a, um, a Northeast, South, Midwest, uh, Pacific Northwest and West. And then within each of those five regions, uh, there is a sales manager and then the sales teams themselves. Uh, so that's sales. Um, we also have a, um, a VP of mass market reporting to the CEO. Uh, so that's our mass market users. And then we have our marketing VP. Uh, and then in terms of uh, operations, we have our ops VP. Um, and below them are the various ops teams and below them are the drivers. So this will form the basis of our role hierarchy for our Salesforce users. Uh, turning to the system landscape, uh, so we have a number of requirements uh, that we need to deal with across 
uh, both sales, marketing and operations. Um, so starting with uh, the existing systems, they have an existing uh, website and portal. This includes the um, publicly accessible static pages as well as the portal functionality that they're looking to replace. Uh, my proposal is that we will migrate all of this functionality to a Salesforce community. And in that way, we simplify the landscape rather than have um, uh, a web server with the static pages. We'll move all that content uh, into the Salesforce community. Um, in terms of other existing systems which will be uh, retained, uh, there is a customer master. Uh, there is a routing system. Uh, this contains uh, uh, algorithms and IP that uh, the business use in order to set up their, their delivery routes. Uh, so this will be uh, retained and interfaced with. They have a billing system, which is based on NetSuite. Uh, that will be retained. Their existing CRM will be replaced. and migrated to Salesforce uh, through a ETL tool and the associated project to set that up. Um, in terms of taking customer payments, there's a system called Credit Force. Um, this is able to process credit card uh, payments. Um, we also have um, uh, need to interface with multiple uh, customs approval systems or, um, in various geographies. Uh, there's 20 of those. Um, the trucks uh, report uh, their position uh, via GPS. So I've made the assumption that there will be a uh, GPS uh, tracking system in order to capture that data uh, and store it and we will have integrations um, in order to meet the uh, requirements um, that are identified. Um, in terms of um, other third-party systems, there's an e-signature requirement. Um, so this could be achieved uh, through a third-party product such as Adobe eSign or, or uh, DocuSign uh, with a pre-built integration with Salesforce. Uh, we also have need of address validation. I've made the assumption uh, that this will make use of a third party uh, application to access the US Postal Service data. Um, and we will look for a solution which also comes with a integration uh, for Salesforce. Uh, in terms of identity management, uh, so um, on premise, that off. So on premise we have um, Active Directory, two copies, one for internal users and one for external users. There's a request to retire the um, Active Directory for external users um, in order to simplify um, the identity management process. So my proposal is we'll make use of a cloud identity product such as Okta, and the functionality for the external users will be, uh, the identities will be mastered therefore in Okta. We'll also make use of a um, standard connector um, for Active Directory in order to uh, do the credential validation, and um, we will get the superior version uh, of Okta which will take care of the uh, user provisioning and uh, deprovisioning. Uh, okay, so uh, in terms of the of the integration of the external systems, uh, we'll be making use of um, an ESB product, cloud ESB. So, for example, Mule, um, and that will serve as the integration point for each of our uh, external systems 
in order to achieve, achieve the orchestrations. Uh, there's also a requirement around master data management. Uh, given the volumes that are involved, um, I'd like to make use of a specific MDM product which will work in, ter uh, in terms of uh, distributing and uh, synchronizing the customer master with Salesforce. Um, but we also have uh, the billing system which is likely to need to be integrated as well. So in that way, I, th uh, I propose that we make use of a master data management product. Um, in terms of the capabilities of the ESB, we'll be using it for orchestration as well as protocol uh, adaption. Um, there's also an, an, uh, an opportunity to um, make use of Salesforce Connect uh, via the ESB in order to surface more detailed GPS tracking data uh, from the tracking database. We can therefore um, take a feed from the tracking system uh, and then publish that uh, as uh, OData which can be ingested into Salesforce as external objects. Uh, finally, we've got some um, requirements around marketing, uh, which will give us need of a marketing automation product. So, for example, Marketing Cloud would be a suitable choice based on uh, the maturity of the integration that exists uh, between Salesforce CRM and Marketing Cloud with Marketing Cloud Connect. Um, in terms of our uh, end users, uh, we've got our customers. Uh, they will need to access um, through a website and there's a requ request uh, requirement for uh, the ability to use uh, Facebook or uh, Twitter etc social sign-on uh, so that will also be needed as well that's the end users web browser uh, Salesforce will need to communicate with the social platform in order to achieve that uh, um, uh, authentication process. Uh, drivers will have a tablet mobile app which will be connected through Salesforce. This will be the Salesforce One uh, mobile app which will allow them to um, uh, perform their uh, tasks on the move. Uh, finally we have reporting requirements which will be achieved through uh, an additional BI analytics tool uh, which will be integrated with um, with Salesforce but also with the other um, source systems of record, the billing system and the customer master. Uh, we have uh, cross uh, system reporting requirements uh, which will uh, need the use of an additional product. Uh, so that's the landscape. If we have a look at the uh, data model, um, we're making use of uh, quite a lot of standard objects uh, within Salesforce. So, um, starting with the account, so we have two record types for our corporate uh, uh, customers and our uh, mass market customers. Uh, there's approximately uh, 250,000 plus records um, and these will be owned by our sales users for the appropriate record type, either corporate or uh, mass market. Uh, from the point of view of uh, contacts, um, we have 5 million contacts who are the end customers. Um, we have need of cases for our customer service and also campaign and uh, campaign member in order to uh, achieve the marketing requirements. And campaign members will be made up of contacts. Um, in terms of the sales process, this will be handled through opportunities and uh, opportunity line items, uh, which will be the uh, products that uh, customers are buying. In terms of the product management itself, 
the products will be contained within the standard Salesforce standard Salesforce price book, um, product price book and price book entry. Um, products and price books will be owned by marketing. Uh, they will be public read only. So this will allow uh, other users in the system to be able to access the, the information but not uh, create it. In terms of price book, this is how we will uh, satisfy our gold, silver, and bronze uh, product lines. Um, price book entries will be owned by marketing. Again, uh, public read only. Uh, opportunities will be owned by sales. And the sales process will result in the creation of a contract. Uh, the contract will also be owned by the sales user. And the contract will be integrated with the e-signature system and the resulting um, uh, contract document as a PDF will be stored within Salesforce files object. Uh, once the, uh, say the opportunity has been closed one, we're going to make use of a flow to produce uh, a record within Salesforce uh, standard order object. Uh, this will equate to the shipment which is described. We'll also have the uh, order lines. And the order will be uh, associated with an active contract. Uh, now in terms of the custom objects, we have need of a object to store the route and also the schedule information. The schedule information is created within the uh, scheduling system. Sorry, within the uh, routing system um, and is integrated uh, into, uh, into the custom object within Salesforce. Uh, in terms of the volumes of these objects, these are uh, large data volume objects. So for, a, for the schedule we have up to a thousand a day, which equates to about 400,000 a year. Uh, the route, there's uh, 30 routes per schedule each day, uh, so basic math says that there's about 1.2 million uh, routes that are going to get generated within uh, any particular year. Uh, I think there's also a need for a truck custom object uh, in terms of uh, associating and, and scheduling that information. Um, in terms of the drivers, these will be Salesforce users from the standard uh, user table and the driver will be assigned uh, to, uh, to a particular um, uh, order and uh, schedule. And uh, the order will also be associated with a route. Okay, um, let's look at the uh, requirements. So first of all, the marketing requirements. So um, at the bottom of page two is a description of campaign management process. Uh, so the way in which uh, this will work is uh, the master data management system will retain a copy of uh, all of the customers within Salesforce, the scenario that uh, describes that uh, these are existing customers. Um, those will be uh, selected using um, uh, Salesforce reports and then, the, and then added to a particular campaign um, as uh, campaign members. Um, and then the synchronization to Marketing Cloud uh, will, um, uh, the Marketing Cloud Connect synchronization will be, uh, uh, allow those to be sent over to Marketing Cloud so that the emails can be sent out. Uh, in terms of uh, then uh, tracking the results, uh, the results will come back through the MCC uh, connection into campaign member uh, and then we will each day we will run a, 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 a batch apex process over the campaign members to select those who have responded in a positive manner and for each of those uh, we will create a, a, an opportunity record 
uh, within Salesforce uh, for that qualified customer. Uh, the assignment of the opportunity owner will be based on the region and it will be um, assigned uh, within uh, Apex to a, um, a sales user within that region. In terms of when the sale is closed, there's a requirement for um, uh, e-signature uh, integration. So this will be handled through our uh, e-signature um, product. Um, so um, when the uh, opportunity reaches the, uh, the stage of uh, signature required, uh, then a uh, email template will be used uh, and sent through um, a Salesforce process uh, to the customer. Uh, with the link uh, to the e-signing website. Um, they will then fill in the information, uh, they will then complete the, the, the signature process uh, and then the integration with the e-signature product will send that information back into the Salesforce um, uh, opportunity object in order to update that record. Uh, this will then lead to the creation of our order. Uh, so we have an integration uh, described at the point when the opportunity is closed run, closed one. We will need to create an order. This will be achieved through a, a, a Salesforce uh, flow, um, uh, headless flow, in order to copy the opportunity uh, data to the order fields and the opportunity line items will become our order lines. Um, at that point then we need to um, integrate with both the uh, scheduling system, uh, which I think I probably forgot to put on the diagram, I did. Okay, so we need to uh, have Salesforce um, uh, uh, obtain the appropriate schedule from the scheduling system and also create uh, an, uh, an invoice within the uh, billing system. The way in which, which this will be achieved will be via the ESB. Sales, uh, when the opportunity is closed one, Salesforce will use an outbound message uh, targeting uh, an endpoint on the ESB. Uh, that will contain the details of the opportunity. The ESB will then be able to uh, use a SQL query to uh, request additional information from the Salesforce records um, and then uh, use that to uh, um, make additional calls to the scheduling system uh, in order to uh, get um, the appropriate schedule and then to create the invoices within the billing system. Once those, uh, the orchestration of those transactions has been completed, the um, ESB will update Salesforce um, uh, uh, opportunity and order records uh, with the associated information. Okay, turning to the scheduling requirements on page three. Um, so we have um, a requirement to load the schedules uh, to Salesforce uh, daily from the scheduling system. Um, this will be achieved uh, through the, uh, uh, via the ESB. Uh, so all our integrations will be centralized on the ESB. Uh, the ESB will upload the information to Salesforce uh, using the bulk API. Um, in terms of uh, operators being able to review and publish the schedule, uh, so our schedule custom object here uh, will make use of a quick action in order to update uh, a, um, a pick list value in order to make that, make that, uh, that record uh, be uh, available. Um, there's a requirement that the uh, system uh, prevent or the future system prevents uh, double booking and over allocation so this will be achieved through the use of um, custom apex um, so we'll have a trigger uh, based over the order object that when the uh, order is updated um, we will then have um, the business logic to make sure that um, um, that uh, there are no um, rules have been violated around uh, double booking or, uh, or overage in terms of uh, capacity, I assume. Um, we also need to prevent the user from scheduling shipments against uh, unpublished schedules. This will be achieved through a validation rule. 
Um, so customers should be able to purchase the shipment uh, by working directly with uh, the operations staff. Um, so this will be um, a, a similar process in terms of the opportunity creation that was used within the marketing, but it will be done uh, through um, a uh, Salesforce visual workflow in order to capture the customer's information, uh, locate their appropriate uh, existing account, um, and then create the opportunity. They'll then be able to select the products uh, which are required uh, in order to build up um, uh, that opportunity and process it through to close one. In terms of the payments, so there's a need uh, to um, uh, process credit card payments. So the um, payment system is Credit Force, um, which will be integrated with our uh, ESB. Uh, in terms of um, the method of integration, there's two stages to this. So, so in terms of the um, operator who's taking the credit card details and the payment, uh, they will see uh, a payment page served by Credit Force uh, within their web browser. This will be achieved through a Salesforce Canvas connected app uh, in order to use um, the uh, sign request uh, API uh, in order to pass through the information of the payment that's required and then get the result as to whether or not the payment uh, was successful. Um, once that uh, payment has been taken, uh, Credit Force will update the billing system via the uh, ESB uh, directly, so there's a second uh, phase to that uh, transaction. Uh, this is done in order to make sure that within Salesforce we're not storing any credit card uh, information uh, for reasons of PCI compliance. Uh, in terms of um, the custom system, so we have up to 20 custom systems that we need to uh, pre-clear pre our, our manifest with. Uh, this will be achieved via the ESB. Uh, in this way, we only need to create a single uh, type of integration between Salesforce and the ESB. The ESB is then uh, able to uh, adapt uh, different versions of its uh, call-out message to the custom system in order to um, adhere to their particular contract. Uh, in terms of the information flow there, um, so this would be... Um, uh, information which is contained within the order and uh, the order line uh, system. Uh, so in terms of uh, the method of integration, um, when the order reaches the appropriate status, an outbound message will go from Salesforce to the ESB. The ESB will then be able to uh, gather any additional information about the uh, order lines and then transmit that uh, manifest information to the customs uh, in the appropriate region. Uh, in terms of uh, routes and route planning, um, so uh, there's a need to update the routes on a nightly basis. So this will be achieved uh, through a, a, using the Salesforce bulk API to uh, extract the orders for the following day. Uh, this process will take place on the ESB um, and uh, will run overnight to extract that data. It will then update the routing system and then as the results uh, come back they will be assembled on the ESB and then finally updated to Salesforce uh, through, the, uh, through the bulk API. Um, and that will be updating the schedule object and also the order object. Uh, there's a requirement that uh, schedule confirmation is then sent uh, via email to the customer. Um, we will be centralizing all of our customer communications from uh, Marketing Cloud. Uh, this includes uh, email and SMS. Um, so uh, the way that this will be achieved is uh, there will be uh, uh, make use of the Marketing Cloud Connect uh, integration. Uh, so when the order uh, record uh, uh, um, uh, is updated uh, following the confirmation, then that will uh, initiate a process within Marketing Cloud to trigger an email send. Uh, Okay, we have requirements around uh, shipment uh, tracking. So the trucks uh, have GPS sensors and um, will uh, transmit their coordinates uh, every minute. Um, I make the assumption that uh, this GPS tracking will be cached within uh, a cloud-based um, uh, database. Uh, what I will propose to do then is that um, 
uh, every minute, uh, the uh, ESB will query the uh, positions of the trucks of the day and then update uh, through the Salesforce REST API uh, the current location uh, of uh, each of those trucks. Um, so within the, uh, the truck object um, uh, and also the uh, order object, we will have visibility as to where the, the uh, vehicle is currently located. Uh, in terms of gaining access to the full set of data, this will be via the uh, integration uh, which is using Salesforce Connect. Um, so it will be possible uh, to uh, view for any particular truck or uh, order uh, the, the full history of uh, the GPS uh, um, records. Uh, in terms of the delivery signature, so uh, on the mobile app, the uh, Salesforce One mobile app, the driver will uh, obtain a, a signature uh, from the customer. Um, this will be achieved uh, through um, a, a Canvas app, which will be visible uh, within the uh, driver's tablet. Um, once they have uh, uh, processed that signature, then the integration from uh, the signature system will update the uh, order within uh, Salesforce uh, and likely capture a copy of that um, uh, signature. I think we're pretty much out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Should we go question? into Q&A? Yeah. So, um, okay, so, no, you go for it, go for it. Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, what's the, how did you decide when to use a large data volume? Okay, so in terms of, um, you know, the large amounts of data that we have, so we've got within the, uh, Within the requirements, there's a description of uh, the number of routes which are run every day um, and the, the number of schedules that exist. So there's uh, about 30 routes per schedule. Mm -hmm. um, it's given on a daily basis. I extrapolated it out. So it would have been about 360,000. I've rounded it out to, to 400,000 schedules. Uh, and that would give us uh, approximately 1.2 million routes. Uh, in terms of um, how, how would we deal with that? Is that what you want to know? No, I want to know, you know, what made you decide to use, uh, you know, large data volume uh, instead of uh, standard objects? Uh, is this because of number of records or do you have a number that said, you know, if the number of records are over a certain number, we'll use large data volume? Okay, so um, we need a place to store the schedule and the route. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see any standard objects which uh, would make use of that. Therefore, I, I'm proposing that we use custom objects uh, to store to store that information. The schedule data itself, the schedule and the route data itself, comes from the um, the external system. <coughs> uh, we copy of it within Salesforce. Okay. Okay. So you're replicating that data in Salesforce. Uh, that's right. So there's so um, there's two cases where the schedule uh, information is updated. So at the point of the opportunity being uh, closed one, um, we're going to make a call out via the ESB uh, to the scheduling system. And I think I've got slightly confused as to whether or not the scheduling system and the routing system are the same thing. Just check that. What's your assumption? Uh, say that again. What's your assumption? Uh, my assumption is that it's it's all coming from the routing system, and there's just a bit of interchange language. So these are the external systems. It is it is the routing system and the billing system and the customer master. So the information that we need is, is generated within the routing system at the point of opportunity close one. We need to advise the schedule and route which will be uh, used for that particular order. Uh, but then there's also an overnight process as well. So okay. why store the data in Salesforce, the routing information, when you can use an ESP and uh, 
pull the data in real time, uh, like Lightning Connect or something? Um, so, okay, so the... Uh, Can I suggest we restructure the question? Yeah. And just say, you know, because, because what we can't do is ask leading questions. If we have an opinion about a solution, we need to keep that to ourselves and just ask Matt to justify his decision. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, what I want to know is, um, you know, sorry, um, why okay. store data in uh, uh, Salesforce when you can do a real-time integration? Uh, yes, that, that, that might be possible. Um, I, I see that um, you know, this, is, this is core information and there's, there's some requirements within the system, for example, uh, whereby um, we need to produce a, a manifest uh, for the driver. Um, that's, that's one example. Um, I think there's also considerations around reporting. So whilst Salesforce Connect is able to do uh, reporting, there are still limits in terms of the number of rows which can be returned in any particular query. I think it's 10,000. Mm. Um, so, you know, on that basis, what I'm looking to do is for the lifetime of the order and the shipment, I will maintain a copy of this information within Salesforce. Uh, once the, um, the lifetime of, of, you know, that order uh, and that particular uh, delivery has taken place, then we'll look to archive uh, that information off and I would actually add that to our landscape. Um, so there will need to be an ETL process to move data uh, out of uh, Salesforce. Um, so we'll keep a copy of the data warehouse if we don't have it within one of the other primary systems. And then overall, this cross-platform reporting uh, will be achieved through the BI uh, analytics tool. So for example, that could be Einstein Analytics. Okay. What are the advantages there... of using Einstein Analytics for that purpose? So in, in selecting a BI tool, what I'd be looking for is, is uh, good integration capabilities built in so that we don't have to do a, a large amount of ETL work. So product from Salesforce, we know will integrate well with Salesforce. It's also able to ingest uh, common data formats, which we can look to get from the other systems. You mentioned data, where, data warehouse there. Any particular strategies for populating the data warehouse or technologies that you could utilize to, to fill that from Salesforce? Uh, in terms of, well, well, we'll be looking for an ETL uh, process uh, to do that. So, I mean, let's say for, for instance, it was Einstein Analytics. We know that we have a built-in connector from Salesforce for that. Um, so that would, that would be a bonus. Um, but otherwise, be looking to use, you know, capabilities of uh, you know, the ESB uh, uh, product, for example, uh, in terms of being able to extract the data transform it and load it into um, you know either the data warehouse or the bi tool on a nightly basis okay because i was looking for a feature there like data change capture api to replicate data out to the data warehouse is there any benefit in using that in some way that would, so i mean real time cdc wouldn't be my preference because I, it, in this instance, because I, I don't think we need real-time information within the data warehouse. Instead, I'd be looking to use the bulk API on a on a nightly basis in order to you know take the previous day's orders uh, and move them out. This seems to be a transactional business, sort of on a, day, a daily cycle. So um, I, I think that that would be an appropriate uh, approach. Okay, so trucks sending their GPS coordinates every minute. Um, where is that data housed? in your system landscape? Yeah, I made the assumption that we have a, some kind of a GPS uh, you know, tracking system. So, you know, something on, you know, AWS or Azure or whatever, it would, it would basically be some kind of a, uh, a SQL or non-SQL data uh, database. Uh, so that's where the real... Uh, just put it on AWS. Okay. So the, um, Matt, um, I mean, I hope, so I, you know, I used to work for OnStar. So all the cars sent uh, GPS data. Uh, so uh, that's um, interesting. Have you? Why have a middle layer? Why can't the trucks uh, send the GPS coordinates to 
uh, a mule server and uh, the you know mule can basically put it into salesforce yeah so i mean logically you know i, I see the need of a, of a, of a database uh, to you know capture the data and stage it um, and then integration capabilities to move it on it could be that physically that could be you know housed within a, a, a product such as mule but the, the, the capabilities that we're looking for is that you know we've got uh, about a thousand trucks out there sending uh, their position every minute. Um, we certainly, you know, don't want to put that immediately on Salesforce um, on Salesforce platform. So we'll need to stage it. Uh, and then my proposal is that um, every minute, um, the if the position of the vehicle has changed, then it would be updated to Salesforce uh, to override the previous value on the order of the, the, the truck's current current location. Um, and we can also keep the previous location in a separate set of fields. These, and these would be uh, custom geolocation fields um, on, on the truck object. Sounds like a lot of data. In terms of, so what we're capturing, so uh, let's say it's on our custom truck object. Yeah. Here, I would see that there's two sets of fields. So we've got, you know, geolocation, that long field, we would have current and uh, previous position. So for each record, we would have two sets of fields that just says, this is where the truck is now, this is where it was you know, previously, and a timestamp for that. Uh, and in that way, we provide the high level information which is required uh, for the end user uh, without swamping, um, without swamping the Salesforce platform. Should it be that somebody wants to drill into the details of where a truck's been that day, uh, this is how I see uh, Salesforce Connect and external objects being used. So let's just add the external objects on, green and green. But if I'm traveling, sort of, if I'm a truck and I'm traveling for an hour, so every minute there's an update, there's an API call in Salesforce. Yes or no? Yep. Uh, yes, there would be. There would be, but I, I, I see that the updates, the updates that were made, that are made every minute, um, those could be pushed through um, either the composite REST API um, or uh, through the bulk API. So we're making um, far fewer API. We're not making one API call per truck. We're making one API call per minute, which will update multiple truck. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you can you explain why you chose bulk API instead of a composite API? Uh, I think we need to look at in in more requirements. But I mean, what we're looking to do is is work within uh, yeah governor limits. So the number of records that we can update in a in a single API call, you know, would be limited uh, to two hundred. Uh, if we use the bulk API, then it's, it's an asynchronous process. We'd have to trade off whether or not we got the, the throughput of processing it in the, in the bulk API, uh, you know, happening in a timely fashion. So those would be the trade-offs. My preference would be initially to go with the bulk API. It, it, it should prove adequate. Okay. <clears throat> how long have we got? Sorry, Matt, how long have we got to quiz you? Is there a time limit? Uh, We've got about 18 minutes on the clock. You can keep going. <laughs> okay. There's lot. There's lots of stuff here, so please feel free. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's jump in. Let's just talk about um, custom service. There's 20, 20 different APIs for the different countries for the customs pre certificates. Is there, so what happens, where's durability in that process? So, you know, you make, make a request asynchronous out to MuleSoft and it goes out to get the certificate. How, you know, what, how do you know, you know, what happens if that's can't reach that, that API, you know, mm -hmm. that surfaced in Salesforce, is that handled in the EBS? Where's that yeah. surfaced? Yeah, absolutely. So. The method of integration from Salesforce to the ESB, which is the first step, I would see that being um, uh, achieved simply through an outbound message with, with the main order information. Um, uh, but let, yeah, okay, so what's... I'll, 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 so the, the ESB, 
the ESB will then be able to call back into Salesforce to get any additional information that it needs in order to create the manifest. It's then going, we're then going to need to know which of the customs uh, servers could, could be one of 20 that we want to send to. Um, so I see that that will be happening within the, within the ESB. Now that message will, will go out and if it's not um, responded within in a particular time, we can make use of the features of the ESB to retry. If the retry fails a certain number of times or after a certain amount of time, then we can update Salesforce again with a, with a failure message. So in terms of failure between the customs uh, systems and the ESB, that would be how I would handle that. In terms of failure within uh, Salesforce, so let's say for some reason we, the outbound message can't get to the ESB, feature of the outbound message is it will retry for up to 24 hours. Um, so it, it, that, it takes care of that retry. Uh, we can also have um, uh, exception reporting on Salesforce for any uh, pending customs uh, approvals, which have, have not been, you know, actioned within a certain period of time. Okay. Is, is there any way that you could have avoided that call back in, or why are you calling back in? So, could you not get the entire payload out? So, my preference would be to use outbound message because it, it, it simplifies the retry durability, um, but it's only limited to a single object. Uh, I foresee that we probably need to have the order and order lines and possibly some other object data as well. So in order to assemble that message, I would see that the ESB would uh, call back in. Uh, that would have been set up at the time that the system was commissioned by way of a uh, connected app within Salesforce using an OAuth web server flow in order to obtain a session. So that would be done um, at the uh, you know, at system startup and then the ESB has got an access token and a refresh token. When you say preference, is that a preference to another technology or just generally speaking? Um, so other alternatives, we could, for example, use uh, uh, an Apex callout in order to create uh, the full message uh, of our choosing. Uh, we could also use a platform event, uh, for example, um, and you know, possibly serialize the payload within a, a, a large field as a JSON string. Um, those require more development work. Um, I think for the purposes of what I'm trying to achieve here, I would see that the majority of this integration work takes place on the ESB with the, with the skill set required there. And from a Salesforce platform point of view, we make use of standard platform features. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was looking for, Matt. Yeah. I don't know if I picked that personally because I'm deep in platform events, but yeah, you yeah. mentioned it, and then I think you justified that pretty well, actually. So yeah, fair dues. I've got more. <laughs> if you want, um, yeah, fire away, fire away. So you know, I think you said assignment of something opportunity would be would happen in apex and this might fall into your bag um Gemma when you hear what I'm about to say is yeah why did you make the decision to do assignment in apex yeah so um we're Simon, sorry go ahead Gemma sorry Mike assignment of what I think it, I'm not sure what record you were talking about assignments of something in Apex is what I yeah. picked up. Maybe just explain that. So this was this was I think if the one you're referring to is is part of the marketing requirements. So marketing will run a campaign um, using Salesforce, uh, you know, campaigns, campaign member objects. Um, this will be executed by Marketing Cloud, but ultimately the results will come back into the campaign member. So we'll have the campaign member status. The way that I see this working is that uh, at the end of each day, uh, we will have uh, a batch Apex process, which is going to go and look at the results in campaign members. And any of those records that, that qualify as an engaged customer, we want to create a, uh, a new opportunity for them. Um, so uh, there's no standard processing that would do this. Therefore, uh, yeah, I see this being done through Apex. Um, and then ultimately, this was previously a marketing process, we now need to hand it off to sales in the appropriate region. And so it would be as simple as the record owner, but we would need to determine uh, which region the opportunity was being created for and which was the appropriate um, agent 
that, and this could be based on their current, you know, their current workload, for example. Um, but that could be achieved, you know, through some custom apex. Okay. Um, there's a requirement to for customers to be able to log into the portal using Facebook or Twitter. Could you talk mm -hmm. us through how you add up things? Yeah. Um, so uh, our end user up here with their uh, web browser, um, they would like to log into the uh, Salesforce community. Um, so um, in order to uh, use their um, social uh, the, 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 the social credentials, what we'll need to do is set up within Salesforce um, is a um, uh, an authentication um, social authentication handler uh, with a, um, uh, a registration uh, uh, Apex registration handler, um, and then it would, it would work through uh, uh, a, an OAuth flow. And which OAuth flow would that be? Uh, it would depend on the particular um, uh, social uh, provider, but it, it, you know it's likely to be OpenID Connect. Okay, can you talk us through how that is, how that works? Yeah, absolutely. So That's the selfish. <laughs> what was that? That's a selfish question. Go no, for I, it. I've, I've, yeah, I've been waiting for the I've waiting for the sign on flow question for a few minutes. Uh, okay, so the, <laughs> so the, the user will be on their browser. They will attempt to uh, to access uh, Salesforce. They don't yet have a session, so the response will go back. Step number two. Uh, to their browser, telling them to redirect to the appropriate uh, social provider. So let's say, for example, it's Facebook. Uh, the request will go to uh, the social platform and the response will come back with the credentials page. The user will then enter those credentials and they will be sent back for validation. So that's step number five. Um, the response will then come back. Let's assume that it's positive. Uh, the response will come back uh, containing a, uh, a an access code which um, can then be which will pass back through the browser redirect and then be sent to Salesforce's uh, authorization endpoint. Um, at that point, sales, the Salesforce platform is able to extract the access code from the response, and then Salesforce will contact the uh, identity or the authorization sorry the authentication provider directly in order to obtain. Um, uh, the information about the user's identity, and this will be passed to the registration handler Apex Pass. So this will likely contain their email and um, their first name and last name. Uh, that will, uh, if the user has not been previously uh, created within Salesforce, they will then uh, be created by the registration handler class uh, as a Salesforce user record and associated uh, contact. Um, and then finally. Uh, the response will go back to the web browser, uh, displaying the, uh, the the web page within Salesforce. Okay, and how will the flow know where to send a user to once that once they've been authenticated? Uh, it's uh, it's encoded within the URL uh, and it's passed through the relative uh, the, the respective flows. Um, so ultimately. They will be redirected back to that um, in the final response. Okay, do you know what the parameter is for that? No, can you tell me? It's a relay state. Is that is that true in, in OAuth or is that is that is that just SAML? It might be SAML actually, sorry. I always get them mixed up. Okay, nice, thank you. That was your question. Um, Next one. So requirement around published schedules, being able to look at future published schedules for customers. How are you going to differentiate a published schedule versus an unpublished schedule? And what are the security set up? What's, what, how are you going to set up the security to support that? Yeah, so the uh, schedule itself uh, is here. And I, I think it's an additional relation that we should draw in here that uh, makes this possible. So, 
Uh, we've got customers who have a customer community license. They want to be able to view schedules. Um, this will be achieved through the use of a sharing set uh, based on the uh, customer's uh, account. So the relationship, there's a lookup relationship between account and our schedule. Um, we can also add it when we create the um, when we create the sharing set. We can also specify um, uh, that they should only see schedules where a particular custom field has a particular value. So that could be a checkbox field that says whether or not it's published. Okay, so is that assuming that those schedules are only schedules for that customer or are they schedules that any customer could use? Uh, so you know, it would be based on schedules, schedules for that particular account uh, whereby a customer is, uh, is that particular account. A customer is represented by that account record. Okay, so this is an individual customer schedule as opposed to a truck schedule or delivery schedule. Is that right? Uh, no, it, it is. Uh, okay. Uh, is there some more details on this one? Is it on a particular page? Uh, I am thinking about uh, page four, where it talks about portal, being able to view to published schedules for informational purposes, mm -hmm. um, and then obviously page three, the whole scheduling section as well. So there's yeah. a the first point talks about shipments being allowed, which you've re which you've actually solved already. Um, I was just trying to understand. Yeah. Um, whether the schedule is specific to customer or whether it is specific to an internal process. So how are you going to get that? What does that information mean? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's it's not clear to me, so I've, I've, I've made a, a, a couple of assumptions. I think, you know, the, the example I just talked through here was where um, we were going to look at schedules which are associated with a particular account. Um, that could include uh, multiple orders, for example. So um, I made the assumption that uh, you know there won't be mixed customers on a, on a particular schedule. If there were, however, um, I think the way that we would need to deal with this then would be uh, through a custom component with some um, with a custom Apex controller, uh, which would access the uh, use cycle to access the the order and schedule and route information. Uh, without sharing in order to determine um, or in order to access the data set and then it could be filtered appropriately to the customer before being returned to the component. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you've got credit card payments that can't be maintained in Salesforce at the moment. How, if I'm a customer service agent and I'm looking at customer's history, how would I be able to determine in Salesforce when a customer was last invoiced and when payments were last made? Uh, yeah, so within the requirements, it, it talks about at the, um, at the point that the payment is taken, uh, that the, um, the outcome of that, that payment is recorded against the order itself. So I think that could be one way that it's done. You know, as an agent, you don't be able to see the customer's historic orders. We'd be able to say, see how much was paid, um, you know, whether it was successful. Uh, what we don't want, what we don't want, is we don't want to see um, payment data like credit card numbers, expiries, etc. Um, so uh, you know, that would that would be just within Credit Force. So I think it could be could be within order information. Another alternative would be uh, that we could expose the the invoice information. Um, within Salesforce by way of Salesforce Connect again. So going by the ESB, uh, the billing system, we could have access to uh, its APIs in order to extract invoice uh, header and uh, line information. And then that could be exposed to Salesforce as, as external objects um, and associated with the appropriate account. And how does Salesforce Connect access that data? Um, so the endpoint for Salesforce Connect would be um, the ESB. Um, so we would uh, 
we would first set up the data source uh, within uh, within Salesforce and specify the uh, particular protocol that we would, we would want to use. Uh, OData 4 uh, would be uh, the most sophisticated. Uh, we then need to be able to say how we will secure it uh, in terms of the authentication. Um, for this kind of connection, that could be done through a named principle um, um, uh, authentication. Um, and um, the Salesforce administrator could enter the appropriate credentials uh, within uh, within the setup step there. Okay, would you be thinking, how would you structure those credentials? Would there be one per user? Uh, no, I, I, I would see that the name principle, so one, one system wide would, would suffice because we're able to secure the invoice data based on whether or not the um, the uh, agent using Salesforce has access to the account. So if you can see the account, you can therefore see the invoices. Um, okay. We wouldn't create a tab for viewing all invoices. Um, so I would propose to, to deal with it in that manner. So what are the limitations of Salesforce Connect in for this use case? Well, Salesforce Connect is amazing. There's no limitations whatsoever. <laughs> uh, That's it. So give that, that, give that badge a triangular badge. <laughs> you. Of, uh, yeah, I, I clap, I clap the way up. So, uh, yeah, in terms of what we're trying to do here, in terms of just displaying and reporting information, it's going to be perfectly adequate. If we're looking to uh, initiate um, process automation on Salesforce um, based on updates that are made in the billing system, um, I think currently that's that's not supported. Uh, in the current version of Salesforce Connect, so we can't, for example, write triggers or, or processes off of it. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Just moving quickly on to um, the the file. If you look at page five um, under integration, what does the final bullet point say? Applications that integrate to Salesforce cannot uh, store credentials in the application or middleware. So how would you get around that? I would challenge that requirement. <laughs> You're not allowed. Yeah. Cannot store credentials in the application or middleware. So is this, it, it, it's saying that it cannot, uh, so my reading of that is we can't store Salesforce usernames and passwords on, on the middleware or in any of the external applications. Is that right? Yeah, you've just positioned Salesforce Connect being supported by name credentials. No, I haven't. So, so, well, so first yeah. of all, let's deal with the first question. So applications that integrate to Salesforce cannot store, I'll insert Salesforce credentials in the application or middleware. So, um, all of our integrations are going to happen. All our integrations to Salesforce will be via the ESB. Um, okay. At, at, at uh, system initiation within the ESB, we'll make use of an OAuth web, ser uh, web server flow in order to obtain a, a session token, an access token, and also a refresh token. Uh, we're not going to store the credentials within the ESB. Um, we're going to um, we're going to make use of OAuth to do that. So. Okay. Uh, so, I, so we won't be storing credentials. Uh, in terms of um, setting up Salesforce Connect, um, the named principle there, it would be uh, the username and password uh, information to access the ESB. Um, now, if that, if that itself is an issue, then we could move to a per user um, uh, OAuth um, 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 of authentication method. And then that would make use of a uh, uh, OAuth web server flow in order to go in the opposite direction. Did I understand you right? Is that, does that address your, your question? Yes, thank you. Um, I think I had one more question. You mentioned a tablet application for drivers. Could you talk us through like what kind of application that would be and the advantages of that application? Uh, yeah, so the um, the drivers are internal users within our, our Salesforce licenses. Um, so this will be Salesforce One uh, mobile app um, will will meet the requirements that we need here. The the integration that's called out in terms of the e-signature 
uh, that can be achieved uh, without needing any kind of a custom custom mobile app. So just a standard S1. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got no more questions. Uh, questions, Your Honour. Did he make a recommendation on the type of org, enterprise, professional? Uh, yes, this will be a, a Salesforce uh, enterprise or unlimited edition, and the solution can be achieved through a single org strategy. What was the total number of users again? Sorry, just. just Salesforce users. Salesforce users, yeah. Um, yeah, not not that many. The, the the numbers that we got were that there were uh, yeah a thousand regional sales and a hundred mass markets, so probably fifteen hundred to two thousand Salesforce users. And then community licenses. What did you say again for that? Uh, so we have customers up to five million. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll make use of uh, customer community licenses and a, and a single community to achieve that. So volume base, you know, sixty thousand logins a month or daily or whatever it is. Yeah, my, I'd assume that money's not a problem here. So, okay. Another one. No, I don't. I'm out. She's out. She's out. Mike's out. Jay's out.